Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. This is NJTV News. Anchoring tonight is Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and welcome to NJTV News. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Thanks for joining us. New tonight, Governor Murphy says public schools will have the option to start the school year remotely. That's if they can't meet health and safety standards for in-person instruction. Any student who chooses to continue remote learning must be accommodated. The blended learning option is a result of ongoing feedback from educators and parents, according to Murphy, and isn't entirely unexpected given the fluctuation in coronavirus cases. Today, the Health Department reported 484 new positive tests. The statewide total is close to 186,000. That's with nine new deaths and nearly 16,000 confirmed and probable fatalities. A positive sign, the rate of transmission remains below one. Those numbers, though, aren't enough to convince the state's teachers unions that educators should head back to the classroom, nor more than 400 teachers in the Elizabeth School District. Joanna Gagas reports. Governor Murphy's been under enormous pressure from the unions, teachers, administrators, principals and supervisors to have school districts go all remote this fall, but that's not exactly the guidance he offered today. Districts that cannot meet all the health and safety standards for safe in-person instruction will begin their school year in an all remote fashion. Public school districts will need to spell out their plans for satisfying these unmet standards in a date by which they anticipate the ability to resume in-person instruction. In a joint statement from the unions and associations, they said the question of whether and when to reopen for in-person instruction is first and foremost a public health decision that cannot be left in the hands of nearly 600 individual school districts. The stakes are too high and the consequences of a wrong decision are too grave. The governor has touted flexibility as the best option for districts, but that flexibility has led to a lack of uniformity across the state with plans that range from in-person to hybrid to some requesting all virtual, as is the case for the city of Elizabeth. Today, 425 teachers have indicated that they have special needs and cannot come to a classroom. That's about 25% of our workforce. We expect that to grow to about 600 by September 11th, as people will then cast a late retirement. It is mathematically and physically impossible if we do not have the teachers to have in-classroom teaching. But until today, districts submitting virtual only plans didn't know if they'd be approved because the governor's mandate required some in-person instruction. Today's announcement opens the door for these plans to move forward. I'm relieved and as a mom, I'm relieved as well. I think it's going to be a much more stable uh, start to the year if we are doing something we know we can do, right? So remote learning, we've been working, many of us all over the, the district in the summer to improve our skills um, with online learning and improve our approach to preparing lessons. And I feel like that's something we can do successfully. The district's working to close the digital divide so all students have access to remote learning. We are in the process right now of distributing 9,000 additional laptops and tablets to students all the way down to pre-K. We, we are preparing instructional uh, videos for parents, students, teachers by our tech department to make that work. Classes are going to be um, contemporaneous. It's going to be live. This isn't going to be re recorded. We're going to take every effort we can and to use these five weeks to make it even better. I couldn't be happier, honestly. Olivia Iheke came to pick up her device today. She said she's grateful her district is planning for remote learning, even if it means missing the start of her senior year. I have asthma, so I'm automatically not safe for coming to school. The deadline to submit their plans to the state has already passed for most districts, so how the governor's announcement today impacts them? Kevin, I assume if a district has submitted with today's step, you'll allow them to resubmit. The answer is yes. The Department of Education said it's reviewing plans as quickly as it can so districts can roll out their fall instruction and those that need it can have the flexibility to start at a later date. I'm Joanna Gagas, NJTV News. 
Well, observers were hoping for a few more details to be hammered out in the governor's announcement. Some say it appears to be a compromise between districts ready to open and those that still need more time. But this flexibility, as Murphy calls it, leaves a lot of unanswered questions and not much time for any new plans. NJ Spotlight founding editor and education writer John Mooney joins me to explain. John, do we know what qualifies a school unsafe to reopen? Well, I think, the, at least in the governor's words today, it's, it's whether they're able to meet the, you know, the guidelines that he and his administration have laid out. Everything to do with, you know, and largely around the conditions of the buildings and the space required to uh, separate kids. I think having enough masks isn't going to be as big a challenge, though one superintendent said, you know, her providing it to two a month to every student, that's 8,000 masks. A, you know, that's a lot of masks to buy. And I think that will be some challenge, but I think they also are stuck with buildings that are cramped, that don't have great ventilation systems. Uh, they're in buses that aren't retrofitted to hold it, hold these kids. And so if they're not ready for that, I think that will be their argument uh, to go back or, or not to go back, to stay in virtual for at least the time being. But the state's going to have to review 600 plants and 600 districts. And uh, the last I checked, the Department of Education is not necessarily overflowing with people especially in their county offices. So there's challenges on all fronts. It's a good point. The governor says, though, that he was facing pressure from both sides to have all remote in person. Did he punt in this decision today? Well, I think, I mean, he, it seems there, he, he laid out five, you know, general principles, education, equity, safety, and health. Um, and one of them, uh, flexibility being one of them. And then the other one, it seemed, was local control. Uh, he seems to be let, letting districts make their own decisions on this. Some are satisfied with that. They always complain when they're mandated to do things. Um, but others are looking for some guidance and really, you know, arguably even some cover uh, in terms of their decisions. So uh, I think he, you know, this is a state of, of where local control is very strong, home rule, and, and it certainly showed itself in this decision. All right, John Mooney, of course, this comes as we watch other schools across the country dealing with this, kids heading back and inevitably being quarantined. So we will check back with you. Thanks so much. Nice to see you. How much influence did the state's teachers unions have on Governor Murphy's decision? Head to NJSpotlight.com and check out John Mooney's full story. There is another argument against reopening schools for in-person classes. We simply don't have the data to understand how the virus spreads among kids. Epidemiologists say that's because they've been under-tested, partly due to mild and non-existent symptoms, leaving researchers with an unreliable pool of information as they make decisions. Beth Pathak is the director of the Coronavirus in Kids Tracking and Education Project. She joins me to explain what impact this could have if students head back inside the classroom. First of all, thank you for taking a few minutes to speak with us today. Why is it that children are underrepresented in our numbers and from what you track? Well, uh, I don't know that children are underrepresented. New Jersey uh, has an older population base than some of the other states. What I think is really important to look at for kids is not what percentage they are of total cases, but rather what the cases in kids are doing over time. Are they increasing? Are they starting to flatten out? Or are they decreasing? And when we look at the data for New Jersey, the thing that we see, unfortunately, is that around about, say, mid-July, the trend in cases in kids started to trend upward. And why is it that the trend is going up? Well, it probably has to do with things opening up, um, relaxing of social distancing and, and, you know, all of those things. I mean, what we know from the research on kids is it seems that most kids get infected with COVID-19 in their own home. They're probably infected by parents and other adults who may be out in the workforce, maybe essential workers, or working in those service and blue collar jobs where you just can't work from home, you have to go out and work. Um, so there's a lot of, unfortunately, there's still a lot of opportunities for kids to get exposed and get infected. Based on your research, should schools reopen in the fall for in-person indoor learning? Well, I think the, 
it's a tough question because on the you 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 have behavioral things like wearing masks and social distancing and i do think that kids and teachers can do that for the most part but the tricky things are the environmental changes that need to happen with air ventilation and air purification. And those are two different functions that happen. Ventilation is bringing in outside air. Purification is actually having machines and filters that are cleaning the air inside the classrooms and inside the different rooms in the building. Um, and so those are expensive modifications to buildings that I, I think we just haven't had the time or the money yet to implement those in all of our schools. Did the trend lines show if rates of transmission are likely to spike if kids are in classrooms? Kids can transmit the virus. And, you know, in terms of people getting really sick, it's really the teachers and the staff in the schools that would be more at risk of becoming very ill. Although children, it's a small fraction of kids who become very sick, but it can happen. Dr. Um, Beth Pontek, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your insight. Okay, thank you. Well, the Big Ten and Pac-12 are the first major conferences to sack college football this fall, canceling the season due to safety concerns from the coronavirus outbreak. The decision came following a meeting of the college presidents on Tuesday and is considered a major blow at Rutgers University as it prepared for a big season, welcoming back Coach Greg Schiano. How will they rebound? Michael Hill reports. The Big Ten Conference, which includes Rutgers University, has blown the whistle on the fall football season less than a week after setting an intra-league schedule. The league blames the unknowns of COVID-19. Uh, there is too much uncertainty now for us to feel comfortable to go forward and have fall sport in the Big Ten. And, and we just need to constantly do the right thing from a medical standpoint to make sure that our student athletes are, have an environment uh, that remains both health and, and healthy and safe. The decision comes after more than 30 Rutgers football players, staff members, and those at other Big Ten schools became infected. Sports writers note the clincher may have been the COVID case of Indiana offensive lineman Brad Feeney. His mother took to Facebook in a post that went viral. She wrote, after 14 days of hell battling the horrible virus, his school did additional testing on all those that were positive. My son even received extra tests because he was one of the worst cases. Now we are dealing with possible heart issues. He is still experiencing additional problems, she writes. Bottom line, even if your son's schools do everything right to protect them, they can't protect them. Keith Sargent, the Rutgers football beat writer for NJ Advanced Media, says the league's college presidents relied on medical data to postpone the season. Some of it came back and it said that um, elite athletes uh, could be at risk for, for, for heart damage. Um, you know, there was one report where as many as 10 Big Ten players who contracted the, the virus have come back with inflammation around the heart. Uh, we, what we do know is inflammation around the heart can lead to a sudden cardiac arrest from intense workouts. Football is obviously an intense workout. In a statement, Rutgers president says our first and highest concern is the health and well-being of our student athletes in our entire community. The conference made the right decision to postpone the 2020 fall athletic season. Sports writer Sargent says it's a huge loss of $50 million in TV contracts, money Rutgers uses to host other sports, men's and women's. I'm a little nervous for future seasons and some of the non-revenue generating sports at, at Big Ten institutions. And it's a huge economic hit for local businesses that rely six or seven times a season on home games, drawing thousands of fans to hotels and restaurants and shops. There's no easy way, there's no sugarcoating, sugarcoating it that everybody is going to feel the financial sting of this one. Analysts say it's too soon to speculate about whether players looking to enter the NFL's April draft would risk injury playing college football in the spring. And it's too soon to speculate about the recruitment of high school football players. The only certainty appears to be there's no competing against the unknown risks of the coronavirus. Michael Hill, NJTV News. 
and a tough vote for the owners of Attila's Gym in Camden County. Their defiance of the governor's executive orders cost them their business. The borough council voted 5-1 to one to rescind the gym's license. The owners made national headlines after refusing to remain closed during the pandemic. The two were previously arrested and even broke into their business earlier this month after it was boarded up by authorities. In an Instagram post, co-owner Ian Smith called the vote, quote, political. In Hoboken, it could cost you if you don't mask up. The city council is considering a $250 fine if you're caught strolling the streets without one and in places where you can't stay six feet apart. There's already similar legislation at the state level. Hoboken council members say they've been watching mask usage in public places and they've got big concerns, not enough compliance, but admit it'll be tough to enforce. A second vote on the ordinance is scheduled for August 19th. The state Supreme Court is giving Governor Murphy the go-ahead to borrow billions of dollars. In a unanimous ruling today, the decision gives Murphy permission to take on new debt without voter approval. It will offset state revenue losses caused by the COVID-19 outbreak. But the administration will have limits. Here to break down the financial and political implications is NJ Spotlight budget and finance reporter John Reitmeyer with NJTV News senior correspondent David Cruz. John, ultimately any borrowing decision making still rests with this committee of lawmakers, but are there guidelines that they'll have to follow? Yeah, Brianna, so the, the ruling, the opinion from the Supreme Court does provide a little bit more specifics in terms of how the state can, can borrow money and what it can be used for. The legislation, the way it was written, was pretty open-ended, uh, and so what the court has done is sort of narrow it to basically ensuring that whatever is borrowed and spent is responding directly to the pandemic. That can mean offsetting revenue losses, but it still has to have that nexus, it appears, to the pandemic itself. They use the example of could, could the state subsidize a stadium and say that that's part of its response to the pandemic. And, and in the ruling, they cast that to the side. So uh, it looks like definitely Murphy wins in the sense that he can still borrow even to offset revenue losses, but there are some new restrictions now that weren't specific in the way the law was written. David, does Governor Murphy and his team see it as a win? I think they certainly do see it as a win because it is a win. I liked, or I think that observers will uh, admire that um, Murphy didn't spike the football. He understands that, you know, nothing comes uh, from borrowing $10 billion whether you need it or not. And so I think that the whole question of this borrowing is something that the, the Republicans are going to try and bring up as they go forward. So Murphy doesn't want to look like he's enjoying uh, the power to borrow all of this money. Yeah, and I guess that relationship with the Senate president and Speaker Coughlin all the more important now because they're on that panel to approve the funding, the money. Absolutely. John, uh, very quickly, um, obviously there were arguments about this being unconstitutional. Um, does the treasurer's office have to also certify how much revenue loss there is and, and how do they go about doing that? So that's gonna be an important element of this. Now we do have to get a certification of lost revenues from both the governor and the treasurer. And you know that's something that happens in bond disclosures, but now it's it's in this written into this opinion, which makes it something that has to be followed. David, I guess this sets up a little bit easier negotiations for the budget that it's uh, been delayed already. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the the idea that you've got ten billion dollars on this credit card uh, helps you say that hey, we can fund a few more things that we need to fund. All right, David Cruz, John Reitmeyer, thank you both, appreciate it. For more of John Reitmeyer's in-depth reporting, sign up for the NJ Spotlight newsletter. There's also a coronavirus edition each night. Head to njspotlight.com and click on newsletters. The state's business community says the Supreme Court ruling won't do enough to get owners back on their feet. Rhonda Schaffler has details on their plea and today's top business stories. Rhonda. Brianna, New Jersey's faltering economy requires some attention and there's more to be done beyond borrowing billions of dollars. The state's business community is lobbying the Murphy administration to consider a regional approach to reopening, allowing businesses to open in those counties with a low number of COVID cases. Tom Bracken is president and CEO of the State Chamber of Commerce. 
the economic crisis uh, is still there. It's growing by the day. People are still unemployed. Our revenues are down. The state needs the revenues. We need to start to address much more aggressively the economic crisis. Bracken, a member of NJTV's Board of Trustees, agrees with Governor Murphy that more federal funding is needed to help New Jersey. Separately, he says the governor's decision to allow school districts to pursue remote-only learning this fall could create a complication for those businesses which employ parents who would now need to stay home with their kids. Jersey City wants to attract more shoppers and diners to the businesses along Central Avenue in the Heights. Tonight, the City Council is set to vote on a $4 million plan to redesign and improve Central Avenue in order to make it friendlier to pedestrians. The state is trying to help small businesses obtain PPE. The NJEDA is launching the first phase of a $15 million program that provides small businesses and nonprofits with access to PPE at a fair price. Meantime, the EDA is now accepting applications for another small business loan program. This program is geared toward businesses with no more than 10 employees. Turning now to Wall Street, here's a look at the trading day. I'm Rhonda Schapler, and those are your top business stories. is running out to be counted in the 2020 census and so far just 65 percent of New Jersey's households have responded. That's a little higher than the national average but not a full count and in cities like Patterson where federal funding is needed most the response rate is significantly lower. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan hit the streets with local leaders as they bring the survey door to door. Patterson's mayor canvassed the first ward here, handing out masks, urging people to fill out their 2020 census forms, deeply concerned that less than half the city's residents have been counted so far, including Illumi Rodriguez and her two kids. Did you fill out the census form? No, I do every year. Okay, did you do it this year? Not yet. Okay, will you do it this year, please, mm -hmm. for them? People think it's a waste of time sometimes to just fill that out. They don't think we count it you know, has a community. I'm gonna do it because, you know, this is my community and I would like to see it better. Whatever it is that the town needs, it's very much dependent on the census. We think that we are undercounted severely. If we get to 150,000, we could be designated a class one city and with it comes more federal funding. The last census counted just over 146,000 people in Patterson, but this time COVID-19 is complicating the count. The Census Bureau delayed door knocking during the pandemic's height. Workers just hit the pavement this month. Since January, 9,800 have been hired or are in the training pipeline in New Jersey, with about 1,500 in Essex County, 1,000 in Hudson, and just 374 in Passaic. But fear of COVID-19 is reportedly pushing some people to quit. The Census Bureau will just keep hiring. We're confident that with the, the amazing applicants we had so far, we're able to get them trained, provide them the PPE they need, the training they need, the device they need. Uh, we're going to get this done in New Jersey. I'm concerned because I know if we, when I looked at the last numbers that we had for New Jersey, we were just shy of two thirds of being counted. New Jersey Counts Director Patricia Williamson points to Patterson, where 87% of children under five live in hard to count areas. Another hurdle, more than 37% of households here don't have internet access to fill out forms online. And the director of the Patterson Alliance says some high-rise apartment dwellers didn't even get paper census forms. They didn't get to people's mailboxes. They, they were thought to be uh, junk mail and were just left on the counter inside the uh, 
buildings. So people didn't necessarily get the paper forms that they needed to fill out. Another obstacle, Patterson's a city where families share tight housing. There are a lot of people in Patterson who are living multiple families in a home and they don't want other people necessarily to know about that because they might be breaking rules about that. Meanwhile, Mayor Andre Saya can hear the clock ticking down to a shortened September 30th deadline. I don't think people understand how significant this is and it only is what once a decade. The mayor says he's going to do this every evening after office hours. He's aiming to get 150 residents to fill out the form. In Patterson, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. That's our broadcast tonight, but head over to njtvnews.org and njspotlight.com for all of our latest news and reporting on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire team. Thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSEG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Every day, nearly 2 million customers across New Jersey rely on PSEG to provide natural gas. And every day, PSCNG is committed to doing it safely. That includes making sure you know what to do if you smell gas. A natural gas leak smells like rotten eggs. If you suspect a gas leak, leave your home immediately. Get far away, then call 911. Remember, smell, leave, call. Protect the ones you love. Learn more at PSCG.com slash gas safety. Now more than ever, we're here for our members. We're working hard to make changes that can help keep your family safe. Now more of your costs are covered, so you can get the care you need. We've made it easier to talk to doctors and nurses without leaving home, and those costs are now covered too. So much is changing right now. What isn't changing is our commitment to you, your family, and your health. Here when you need us most, now and always.